everyone and welcome to session three of the Global Black Feminist Reading Circle. My name is Randy Henderson and I am one of the Black Feminist Reading Circle members of this online group. This session runs from January 20th until June 2nd and includes two week long breaks. Our democratically selected reading material is Harriet A. Washington's book, Medical Apartheid, The Dark History of Medical Experimentation on Black Americans from Colonial Times to the Present. Our book group meets each Tuesday evening from 6.30 to 8 on the Google Plus Hangouts on Air platform. You may find the, Glo the Global Black Feminist Reader Circle on Google Plus, YouTube, and Facebook. And always feel free to join us in reading our story together. So this evening we're going to summarize and discuss Chapter 1, Medical Apartheid, The Dark History, of medical experimentation on black Americans from colonial times to the present by Harriet Washington. We'll start off by introducing ourselves. Okay, who wants to introduce yourself? I'm Kim. I'm from Brooklyn, New York. My name is Georgette Moses and I'm participating from Columbia, South Carolina. And I'm glad we're on chapter one. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm looking forward to it, our discussion tonight. Welcome to the Global Black Feminist Reading Circle. My name is Michelle Odom. I'm one of the co-hosts of the group and I am located in New York City. I think if Vanita is not able to come back in, then I will go ahead and moderate tonight's discussion. This is session three, meaning it's our third book uh, that we're reading. And this session is running from January 20th through June 9th, 2015. Chapter one, Southern Discomfort, Medical Exploitation on the Plantation. In chapter one, Southern Discomfort, Medical Exploitation on the Plantation, author Harriet A. Washington offers an overview of early medicine in the American South. She briefs readers on the beliefs, practices, and conditions in which doctors and African Americans encountered one another. She identifies the shared economic interests doctors held with planters and how this common bond undermined the health of and instilled the fear of medicine or iatrophobia in black Americans, a fear that exists to this day. Primarily focused in the 17 and 1800s, this chapter describes the deplorable public health practices of the era, which only worsened circumstances for the enslaved population. We also learn a bit about scientific racism or the use of scientific techniques and hypotheses to support or justify the belief in racism, racial inferiority, or racial superiority, or altern alternatively, the practice of classifying individuals of different phenotypes into discrete races. One doctor, for example, Josiah Knott, MD, theorized that the distinctive knee joint and long heel of the black man proved he had been created as a submissive knee bender a servant to whites. Another leading voice was that of Samuel A. Cartwright, MD, who identified conditions afflicting blacks such as drapetomania or an insane urge to escape from slavery. Oh. With pseudo-scientific and biblical justifications in place, Planters and medical practitioners freed themselves to administer a series of inhumane treatments to cure a variety of real and imagined diseases and conditions. Fortunately, some enslaved people held on to African beliefs and practices, which provided some relief for those who were ill, and often taught those, these skills to Western practitioners. Ominously for Blacks, 
the owners, not the enslaved workers, determined safety and rationed medical care, deciding when and what type of care was to be given. Scientists also claimed that the primitive nervous systems of blacks were immune to physical and emotional pain and to mental wow. illness, which released physicians and owners from the responsibility of shielding black slaves from painful medical procedures and justified torture, such as branding, whipping, hobbling, and maiming. But most physicians shared the economic and political interest of slave owners and conspired with planters, their real clients, to subjugate slaves by invading their bodies. How does today's Medicaid system perpetuate the historic role of American physicians in the lives of poor people? How does today's Medicaid system, which of course is an insurance plan for poor people, how does today's Medicaid system perpetuate this historic role of American physicians in the lives of poor people. Well, I, you know, I may be the uh, expert here on uh, <laughs> a personal experience with with Medicaid, and um, but I have been talking a lot. So if anyone else wants to approach that question, please do. Hmm. Well, I know it's money driven. It's still money driven and it's still, you know, a way to control what kind of health care poor people have access to because you can't really choose your doctors. And then some doctors, they won't take it because they don't pay enough. Right. So if you really if you really need some kind of specialized treatment, well, you're just stuck with whatever <laughs> Medicaid is going to pay for. And then you're still having to pay, I believe it still comes out of whatever money that you get, you know, you still have to pay a portion, mm -hmm. And but for what kind of care? What kind of medical care is that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It seems like there was some <clears throat> workshop on where the money in Medicaid really goes, and it's all of these companies that have hustles. They, they have these hustles and they pull as much money out as possible so that you don't get any care. So here you have that same plantation owner mentality of how can I get the most money out of the fact that this poor person has this card. Right. And that that's, mm -hmm. that's the way I see it because when I only get 10 minutes to see my doctor and if I need something, I have to come back again. Like he won't do two things in one visit because there's not enough money for him. Mm -hmm. wow. it, it just sounds like all of a sudden somebody spent a whole lot of time coming up with this hustle as opposed to putting the money into Medicare, into, into right. medical mm -hmm. care. Right, right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, again... Quickly. <laughs> yes. Yeah, and um, you know, just as doctors were were building their fortunes on the misery of slaves in the 17 and 1800s, you know, we are still a a source. You know, I do have some good news that I. I wanted to share with you guys and I figured it would come up some kind of way in the discussion so I don't know I guess I'll I'll plug it in here but anyway the good news is <laughs> I moved last Friday so I am no longer homeless okay 
<laughs> and actually, I'm in Brooklyn, Kim. And I that that was the story. Where, where uh, is Bro Oh, you can tell me later. Um, <laughs> tell me where you are later. In the Ocean Hill section of Bed Stuy. And nice. uh, yeah, and it's a brand new building. Yeah, nice, nice. So. Nice. But uh, it's a nice building, and it it you know it's it has an elevator, it has security, and all of that. But the amount of rent that oh. they are charging the system for this tiny little space is mm -hmm. it, it just it boggles it boggles the mind. Um, but that that seems to be how. The whole um, mm -hmm. medical industrial complex or nonprofit industrial complex seems to uh, be benefiting these days from from poor people for you know relatively little service. Like Kim was saying, you know, one visit and they don't want to do two things. So you know, so that means you. The client mm -hmm. has to go running around to multiple appointments because they don't mind wasting your time and energy, um, you know, mm -hmm. as long as they can can do another billing, you know. So anyway, it's pretty it's pretty ugly, but it is an old system, you know. It's where we are. Yeah, I, I agree with um, Kim. Oh, oh, uh, all of you actually I have a first a friend of mine is actually dealing with that now. She lost her job. Uh, she's single. There's nothing offered to single folks. Uh, now she's on Medicaid. Uh, she's suffering from fibromyalgia, which is not understood by any doctors. Uh, mm -hmm. She has to go to a doctor, unemployed, no money, and he wants her to pay cash. And he is among the best, and there are only a few that are that they have, are not knowledgeable about fibromyalgia. So now she's out in the cold, dealing with pain because they will not accept, you know, it's called the Husky Plan, where, yeah, called the Husky Plan, where 90% of the doctors are not on the plan. Mm-hmm. Wow. Mm-hmm. So mm -hmm. she's pretty much out in the cold. They have a few doctors on their list of doctors. And, um, you know, she can't do it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's what she's dealing with. Um, okay. Then so, you call you know, the husky I think it might be the snow here. We have feet and feet. So. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> yeah. 